Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our online audience. Welcome to uh, the people in the room here at Sea Star in Columbia, South Carolina. We're really um, happy to have you here for the last Sea uh, Star talk of the decade. Um, and um, uh, presented today by uh, Professor Linda Worrell, who uh, recently retired from the University of Queensland, but not before publishing over 200 peer reviewed papers throughout her. Career. She's actually uh, uh, the first um, uh, C-Star speaker who's had um, a peer-reviewed journal article uh, dedicated specifically to her in aphasiology. So if you want to look that up, aphasiology, volume 33, number seven, with the first author being Sarah Wallace. Um, Professor Worrell has had a or has uh, a fantastic career. Uh, not only uh, uh, as a strong force for collaborative research in Australia, but also abroad, um, working on research capacity building, the implementation of uh, research evidence, so evidence-based practice, um, and meaningful outcome measurements, and the improvement of psychological and emotional outcomes for people with aphasia. Uh, she'll be talking about that today as well, I'm sure. Uh, and I think she will also say a little bit more uh, about upcoming lectures in a series on curing aphasia. Uh, so stay tuned for those. Uh, CSTAR will be back on February 13th. Questions to this talk we'll deal with after the talk uh, via the chat box. And with that, I'm going to give the floor to Professor Worrell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dirk. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today. As Dirk said, uh, I did retire from the University of Queensland, but um, for this presentation, I'm also representing um, Aphasia Access. And I am also the executive chair of the Australian Aphasia Association, which is the consumer organisation for people with aphasia. As I said before, it's part of a, um, a lecture series that uh, we came up with this idea that uh, there are too many international conferences on aphasia. And this was a Twitter conversation that I had with um, Julius and, and his team there. Uh, and to some extent, we've got three international, international conferences on aphasia. And we thought, well, this seems to be that there's creating too much division in aphasia research. So we thought we would try this virtual conference. And um, in this uh, sort of sphere, of course, there's always technological problems that I'm experiencing today. Um, but the uh, it was Julius who actually suggested this first topic of uh, curing aphasia. So the, uh, the series will go like this. Um, I'm going to talk about the social cure and I'm beaming into C-Star. The second uh, lecture is, uh, will be by Julius, who will be talking about the neuroscience cure and that will go via aphasia access. Um, and that's going to be on the 25th of February. The third lecture is the behavioural cure, and um, that's going to be presented by Miranda Rose via CATS, uh, which is the Collaboration of Aphasia Trialists on the 6th of May. And then the final cure will be a summary, a final lecture will be a, a summary by Professor Marion Brady um, via the Aphasia Centre for Rehab uh, Research Excellence here in Australia. So what we're trying to do is trying to cross geographical boundaries as well as within discipline boundaries. And I've, we've deliberately chosen some of the big research networks in aphasia um, to, to start uh, this off. So our collective aim is to create a vision for the future. And um, I personally would love to develop an aspirational research agenda and, and plan to achieve that uh, future vision. So it's like a strategic plan for aphasia. In this way, I think it, we've never had this before. We, we need to be a bit bold. We need to be collaborative. 
we need to be international, have high impact research, very focused and motivational. And it's something like the Human Genome Project that uh, has been um, mapping the human genome through a collaborative collaboration of research scientists throughout the world. Now, I'm not pretending that uh, aphasia research is possibly as important as the Human Genome Project, but I do think we can learn lessons from um, such scientific achievements that have been um, that have occurred in the world so far. So the social cure. What does the social cure mean? I've actually borrowed that term from a book published by some very distinguished um, researchers here at the University of Queensland. And it's a, uh, they are a team of health psychologists and they are borrowing from the research in social psychology to bring together um, the social psychology and health uh, uh, psychology spheres together. And one of the major premises that you probably all heard is that um, social networks and social identities have a profound impact on health. So much so that if uh, you have social isolation, it's the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. In addition, um, this mashing, if you like, of social terms and medical terms is that um, you've got another sort of uh, mashed term, which is social prescribing, where health professionals refer patients to support in the community uh, because, and it, this originated in the UK, because about 20% 20, 20 of the patient consultations were for social problems. So, but we have always seen um, the social model, if you like, as, uh, as being the social model of disability that we've used in aphasia research. And if you haven't come across the social model of disability before, essentially it, it was begun by uh, people with predominantly developmental disabilities who were saying that uh, they are who they are and that really their disability stems from a disabling society or, dis or a disabling world. And some of the barriers in that world are things like environmental barriers, um, communication barriers, organisational barriers, etc. So um, this has led to the idea that uh, the social model of disability is heading towards some sort of utopia in the world where disability is not seen as a, uh, a problem or a barrier. And uh, if you, the best way to think about this sort of utopia or this, and particularly an aphasia utopia, is to use the analogy of um, Martha's Vineyard sign language. Um, this is uh, often used in the, uh, the rights, the deaf rights literature um, as the beginning of their sort of cause. Uh, what happened in Martha's Vineyard is that there were many um, people immigrated from a region in Kent that had a, a high um, incidence of hearing impairment. And so there were uh, one in 115 uh, children born with deafness on Martha's Vineyard in the early, early years, uh, instead of the one in 6,000 or something that usually occurs. And so um, everyone, not only was there a high proportion of, the, of deaf population, but on the island, there was a high acceptance of sign language by the population because all the parents needed to be able to sign. They also had longer schooling and that was considered to be why in this particular community, deafness didn't become a barrier to participation in public life. It was like um, everyone was using, was mixing both sign language and oral language together. 
and everyone could sign. So what would that look like in terms of aphasia? Well, an aphasia utopia would be where everyone speaks aphasian. That is that everyone is able to, um, to communicate and, and adapt and accommodate to the language impairment of aphasia. It would mean that there wouldn't be any discrimination or, or stigma attached to having aphasia. And it possibly would mean that people with aphasia should have some longer support so that aphasia doesn't become a barrier to participation in life. So let's just have an imagine what a social cure would look like for aphasia. The easiest way to do that is to try to uh, imagine that if you yourself had aphasia and what you would want um, if aphasia happened to you suddenly. So this is what um, I would want and I'm putting a call out there for the poor speech therapist who would have me as a um, as a patient that uh, if I had aphasia I would want a bystander to recognize that I was having a stroke and that I and that aphasia was part of that stroke that um, I uh, that an ambulance was called quickly and hopefully it would be a stroke ambulance and that by doing that quickly, I would have those, uh, the sort of the medication that lessened the severity of the stroke. But the social uh, cure really begins to kick in when I hit hospital. So within, if I was admitted, to, well, I hope I would be admitted to a stroke unit or rehabilitation unit, Firstly, I would certainly want that I had my aphasia recognised so that there was some accommodation to my needs. I would certainly want lots of information in an accessible format. I would want inclusion in all communications about and for me. And um, I don't think my family and, and husband would be able to manage very well, so I definitely think that they would need a lot of support. I would like the staff to have a very positive attitude towards my stroke and my aphasia and that the focus is always first and foremost on my health and well-being. So when we translate that over to what needs to happen in, uh, in hospital for someone with aphasia, that um, we're talking about things like stroke and aphasia awareness. We're talking about um, stroke prevention education. And, you know, this is something I think that uh, we don't do particularly well uh, with our current aphasic clients about secondary stroke prevention. We, um, we need to sort of have an aphasia and family friendly health professional and service. We also need uh, accessible education about diagnosis and prognosis, relationship-centered care, because I would really be relying on my relationship with at least one or two health professionals to guide me through this trauma that I've experienced. I certainly would be looking to have some goal setting for my goal specifically, um, and I, of course, I'd be looking for some challenges that allow me to um, practice my uh, new talking way of talking um, in the on the ward to my family, etc. I certainly would want um, decision making and autonomy of decision making to be involved in decision making. I don't want to be told where I'm going on discharge or what I'm doing. Um, and certainly I would like all those visitors and uh, my family to have had conversation partner training, but also in this stage, very much a focus on prevention and wellbeing. 
So uh, the whole sort of idea is that uh, while I'm in hospital, I want to just return home and everyone wants to return home. So in, um, in Australia, we have uh, something called um, uh, early supported discharge. And um, so that would be something that I would be looking for. Uh, I don't, would, I wouldn't see that I'm sick enough to stay in hospital and I would want my supports in the community while I'm at home. The, it, and it's really in the home where the social cure really begins to operationalize uh, too. And when I'm at home, to be able to live successfully with my aphasia would be my aim. So we've done quite a bit of research in this area so that um, doing things, um, I certainly don't want to be sitting at home watching the TV all day, but be out and about doing things. Having people that are um, that have that accept me for who I am and who can lift me up, uh, and that there would be a groups and centres that I could go to. Also, I would also be keen to have surround myself with people with who, who do have a positive attitude and also to engender that positive attitude myself. So, and of course then once uh, I had found my new normal to uh, hopefully after going through that period of post-traumatic stress, because some people do experience it as post-traumatic stress, that to go through a period of post-traumatic growth. That is that once I had found my new normal, that I would be able to grow personally and begin to give back to the community. So for that to happen, again, that there needs to be a shifting of support to the community. Um, there needs to be a lot more participation focused opportunities and a lot more focus on prevention and well-being, but also more opportunities for people with aphasia to give back. So um, what we, uh, if, if I became aphasic, I would be um, certainly keen to work with the speech pathologist on my goals and work on my outcomes. So. Uh, these are pictures from my phone uh, from the last few months. And so this is really showing, I think, um, how you really need to personalise some of your uh, participation focused social cure. So uh, I would be hoping that the speech pathologist would have worked on things like um, with me to enable me to uh, continue my uh, going out to the theatre, which is the photo with my mother and sister there at the theatre, um, not last night, um, to, uh, to visit my daughter in France and, and have champagne with her in a, in a field um, of vineyards. Um, then I would also hope that I would be continuing to visit my friend and colleague Nina and work with her on things such as this, even with some aphasia maybe. I certainly would be wanting to tr continue to travel the world um, with my husband, my long suffering husband. Um, but also I would be wanting to take um, time out and to not always challenge myself with the communication tasks and do um, some non-communicative activities such as just sitting on the beach and watching the waves. So these would be my goals and my outcomes and I challenge everyone to think about this concept of if you had aphasia, what would you want? 
to have and what would be the focus of your uh, rehabilitation. So I asked people with aphasia and their care partners about this question and I did it on the aphasia recovery connection. And what, here's just a sample of what some of them, they said about um, in response to this question. They would want greater acknowledgement of caregivers and the important role they play in recovery. Um, and I think that that is certainly illustrated by a recent uh, publication by um, uh, Katerina Haley uh, and her team about the multiple roles that caregivers um, play. Friends and family not to desert me. That is that um, what we find is that particularly friends just fall off. And so we don't seem to be addressing this issue in, in rehabilitation. Another person said uh, is talking about that they're losing custody of their children. And um, the courts in every state help those with aphasia. They are not accommodating to us in the family court. They are saying she can't have custody because she can't talk to doctors or teachers. Now, I've been in this situation before where uh, someone, a mother with aphasia, uh, was fighting for the custody of her children. And, um, and we needed to, to advocate on her behalf because she was a very competent mother. Um, so there seems to be a breakdown in that sort of area as well. If I, another caregiver said, if I had aphasia, I would want people to understand that I'm an intelligent person who lives, um, who needs love, friends, hope and patience. Don't treat me like a child or disrespect me. I'm at a disadvantage because it's hard for me to argue back. So this is addressing that issue of stigma um, that people with aphasia experience because they, uh, people don't understand what aphasia is and naturally assume that a language impairment is also um, an impairment to their intelligence as well. So there are some things in there that I think we're flagging that we're not doing very well. On, I asked um, speech pathologists, I said, if, if you had aphasia, what would you want? And this was over Twitter. And uh, some of these speech pathologists talked about to be involved in decisions about my health care and to get as much speech therapy as I wanted and needed for as long as I could while being supported through the transitions of care and hopefully returning to the workforce. So I want everything. And I think we would all want everything if um, we were a speech pathologist and we were uh, we had aphasia. But I think some of those are some of the, the key things that are worrying uh, speech pathologists who work with uh, people with aphasia. A persistent and creative speech pathologist who saw me as a person first. I like that idea of persistency, that this is not just about uh, a hospital speech pathologist uh, working with me for a, for a small period of time and then not sort of continuing to either uh, hand me over to someone else or to accept that I may need to come back and have some uh, a review. So, uh, yeah, so speech pathologists um, wanting everything <laughs> as usual. Uh, so, um, but um, this person said, if I had aphasia, I'd be sad, yet wouldn't want it to stop me. If I couldn't speak, I'd want to write or read. If I couldn't speak, read or write, I'd want so much therapy. And to express myself through song, dance, making a difference, like Gabby Giffords. So I think this person sort of is saying, well, you know, if I couldn't talk, I'd really still need to have some way of expressing myself. Um, and Julia said, I would want the scientists to get serious about curing aphasia, to stop doing underpowered studies, to merge functional cognitive and neurobiological approaches to better understand my condition. And I think that's what we're trying to do here. 
and to construct models that tell me how much recovery to expect. And some of those questions that Julius um, poses, I think, uh, are possibly only ones that can be done um, in, in, a big, in big international sort of settings and contexts. So the next um, thing uh, is just um, reminding, I think, f from my perspective anyhow and from the social cure perspective, that aphasia is not a language impairment only. It affects all parts of life and, and especially the lives around them. It's not a temporary condition. Um, and it's not just present in hospital. And it, but then again, it's also not a life sentence of despair. So it does disrupt lives, but many people with aphasia do find a new normal. And so unfortunately, I think we have this current narrative of aphasia research and, and services, which um, is doom and gloom. And uh, it sort of uh, my, and my experience of what is uh, what people with aphasia and their care partners are saying is that yes, it's it's a terrible, terrible thing to have happen. Um, but many do actually find their new normal and begin to live um, a good life, and they attribute that not <laughs> they don't often attribute that to speech therapy at all. Um, so they attribute it to, to other things and usually their own, uh, their own sort of um, fortitude and their family. Some of the frustration about the narrative of recovery, I think, was expressed um, recently uh, by, in a poem by a person with aphasia in Australia here who had been um, at a stroke research forum. And she was a person who had, uh, who was going to the forum to represent the views of stroke survivors. So this is her poem. What if the diagnosis was hope and the therapy holistic? A prescription was love or the prediction was access. What if inclusion was the norm? And the reach of these possibilities made a shift forwards. What is needed to heal? Drifting in the breeze of my life experience and the future, I pass branches of goodness, just waiting to be given the opportunity to spread seeds of growth. Isn't it about time? We've all waited long enough. So if you see through what she's trying to say, we're using a lot of medical terms like diagnosis, prescription, prediction, but we're sort of not really talking the same language as they want to talk. They want to talk about hope. They want to talk about um, access, inclusion, and, uh, and to feel as if they are um, a valued member of society. So that's really about the social cure and, and the rationale for it. And um, I want to sort of now start to talk about some of our research priorities in this area. I personally think that the prevention of depression and social isolation is the priority in aphasia research. So we have this situation where People with aphasia experience social isolation, they develop sad mood, they have low energy, they begin to avoid pleasurable activities and people, and then this creates this cycle of social isolation, sad mood, low energy, etc., etc. So we know that prevention is better than cure. We know that it's much easier to prevent these things from happening rather than trying to cure them once, um, once the, the mental health condition, the depression is actually there. And what we don't seem to be doing in, uh, in our services or in um, aphasia research at all is looking at uh, prevention. 
So I'm sure that many of you have heard the upstream versus the downstream analogy. But just to remind you of this analogy, it's a, um, based on an Indian fable where there are fishermen um, fishing and, and in a river and um, a, pers a person floats down the river who's drowning. So they, they haul this person up out of the river and save that person. And just as they're doing that, another person comes along and they're drowning. So they, they pull that person out of the river. And then a whole sort of these people, drowning people keep coming down the river. And so they're constantly pulling out people, drowning people from the river. And so they go back and someone eventually figures that why are people floating, going in the river down in the first place and, and drowning? And so they go back upstream and they find that there is a cliff where there's no fence or, or barrier that stops people from falling into the river. And there's a lot of people standing on this cliff. And so simply they build a barrier or a cliff and a warning to say, don't um, go near the edge of this cliff or you'll fall down and you'll nearly drown. So that's the whole analogy. And of course, uh, using that analogy, and there's a, a YouTube video that explains it beautifully. Um, so we ask, why do people with aphasia and their care partners become depressed and socially isolated? And what can we do to prevent that? So we move along to what upstream research we need to be doing. So um, there recently, Robin O'Halloran um, uh, and her team, including myself, uh, published the IFKI Say. And that is a sort of, it's called the Inpatient Functional um, Communication Interview. And uh, it's all about identifying communication barriers on the ward, the hospital and the overall healthcare system. So rather than sort of saying, well, you know, you've got aphasia or dysarthria, and certainly that's still part of the, of the, the assessment process, but the whole focus of this interview is what are the problems, what problems do you experience communicating to your healthcare needs to the doctors and the nurses and the physios, et cetera? And what strategies, what communication strategies do they need to use to communicate with you? So that whole system of um, helping staff communicate with people with aphasia right from the get-go is beginning a social model um, from the very first time that they are in hospital. We are also, um, we've just finished data collecting on a very large um, trial which aims to prevent depression in aphasia. So the trial is a um, a cluster randomised controlled trial where 20 health regions in Australia were randomly allocated to either the experimental intervention, which was a speech pathologist led um, uh, discussion with the person with aphasia and their family member over six occasions um, and uh, helping them and motivating them to uh, to to focus on their well-being and to remain connected and to stay positive. All of the things that we've talked about in from our successfully living with aphasia research. Um, and there's an attention control arm as well. And so what we will do is uh, we're currently sort of analysing those results and um, hopefully presenting the results of the ASK trial uh, sometime next year. We're also um, currently analysing the results of an ICAP trial, that is an intensive comprehensive aphasia program. I think the social cure is, it doesn't exclude impairment based therapies, but it, it um, it's really sort of saying, well, the person with aphasia it needs to decide whether that's something that they do want 
um, as part of their rehabilitation. Okay, so just um, saying that uh, that the ICAP is um, uh, some. It's a we've collected our data, finished collecting our data on our ICAP, and um, and I think what the ICAP does is give a taste of different therapies to people with aphasia. So I guess I'm seeing it as a sort of a a, a smorgasbord of possibilities. Um, so. That's sort of the upstream research that we're doing now. Um, other research that's relevant to the social cure that I've been involved in is about what people with aphasia and their care partners want and whether it matches um, the speech pathologist goals. Um, we've been doing work on how to set goals, particularly um, for people like physios and OTs that the stroke care team, how to set access, uh, in an accessible way, how to be culturally appropriate, um, and we've done that. We've done some work uh, with the Maori population in New Zealand, um, and you also mentioned Dirk about uh, Sarah Wallace's um, uh, Roma study, which is uh, uh, has found sort of what outcomes uh, people with aphasia and their care partners want to be measured uh, from research. And so there's been a large international consensus project around uh, which measures we're all going to use in particular areas. So we've also done a, a, a lot of research on successfully living with aphasia, what it looks like and how people with aphasia how do we help people with aphasia and their care partners get there? We've also um, studied the effect of aphasia on the care partner. And um, there's a term called third party disability. So uh, talking about the social cure still, of course, aphasia groups are, are very much part of um, any social cure because it's really about the connections that people with aphasia have in the community. The research that we've, I've been involved in is um, about what helps people with aphasia um, go to aphasia groups or stay or sometimes leave. Um, and, and we've been working on what makes a good aphasia group. Um, we've our current research has a big focus on managing depression, what works and how do we manage depression uh, via something called a step psychological care approach, which uh, essentially says that uh, people's mental health is the responsibility of everyone and uh, that there are many things that we can do uh, in the early stages to ensure that um, the severity of any mood change doesn't, uh, doesn't get worse. We've done some work on aphasia friendly communication and um, developed some guidelines for written information that is, makes written information accessible to people with aphasia. Um, technology has to play a major role in the social cure. Um, we've sort of looked at how it can be used to measure communication in context and hopefully one day we will uh, with mobile technology we will be able to get rid of our functional some of our functional communication assessments and um, and be able to measure communication as it happens in everyday life uh, and I think and technology we've been looking to see whether it can help achieve greater participation. And certainly some of the work of Caitlin Brandenburg around the CONFIT says that the amount of talk time that a person has um, relates to their, uh, to their level of participation in everyday life. Uh, but this is all sort of leading to um, a repertoire of evidence-based practices and uh, we've been working on what is evidence-based practice in aphasia rehabilitation. 
Um, but more importantly, research is nothing um, if it doesn't become implemented into service delivery. So uh, looking at implementation science to see what helps speech pathologists implement evidence-based practices and evaluating each of those interventions. So the social cure framework, research framework, is really around this sort of like a bit of a, an onion. Um, so you've got the person with aphasia in the middle and um, that you have uh, this ring of support of their care partners around them you have another ring of support of their stroke team. You have another ring of support of the friends and community. And then, of course, you've got the whole world out there, hopefully uh, providing uh, support to the person with aphasia. So if you think about um, the social cure research framework as that sort of series of concentric circles, you can see that we're not only sort of trying to help the person with aphasia, but we're trying to enable those around the person with aphasia to help um, create a new normal and to live successfully with aphasia for that person in the middle as well. So in terms of research priorities, um, where a, a, a paper that Nina and I have um, led and includes people from all over the world uh, is just about to come out in aphasiology, essentially saying that aphasia, the awareness of aphasia continues to be a problem. So we all know about autism. We all know about Alzheimer's. Let's science the heck out of it. We know what works, but it's worked in other health conditions. So we need to work on how to make sure that aphasia, um, that people are aware of aphasia um, in all of those onion layers. We need to certainly sort of work more on what is a communicatively accessible hospital and stroke care. And I'm going to be very brave here and suggest that one of the research priorities is to look at the relative cost effectiveness and patient preference for participation versus impairment interventions. So this is challenging the norm in terms of thinking that we, while the person is in hospital, that they have and it's going to be their only chance to get impairment-based interventions or in rehab. And so that's, that's the starting point, impairment-based interventions. Whereas I see that really we need to make sure that we have participation interventions working equally, at least equally, alongside um, other interventions that the person with aphasia and their uh, and their care partners want. So um, it's that patient preference coming in there as well. We certainly need to do more research on the prevention of social isolation and technology solutions um, for participation have to be part of the solution. Community, the, the community support is not likely to come from the public or the private sector. That long-term community support. Um, and so we need to think about the, the uh, supporting um, the third sector. So the third sector is predominantly not-for-profits. Um, in every other health condition, it's predominantly the not-for-profits that are holding up the third sector. Um, and that are providing that long-term support to people with health conditions. Um, it seems to be that some uh, health conditions are much better at this than us in aphasia. And so again, we probably need to go outside our sort of um, safe realm of speech pathology research and look at organisational psychology and business in terms of looking at how to sustain and develop an effective third, third sector. 
in the uh, aphasia community. And finally, just um, to round up this sort of the whole lecture series is that I would really like to see that we have developed some way like a, a world report card for aphasia services so that we know whether we're getting anywhere with um, improving uh, outcomes for people with aphasia. So it's a, you know, are we there yet sort of type, are we making any difference in uh, the lives of people with aphasia? So um, just to sort of finish on a light note uh, for Christmas as well, um, Sarah Scott is one of the stars of the aphasia community. She um, developed aphasia at the age of um, 18 and is now 10 years post aphasia. So just to sort of finish up that, you know, on a happy note um, and that Sarah um, has announced her engagement. Um, she's 10 years post aphasia saying that there is lots of life after um, aphasia. Uh, and this is a photo of her on Heron Island, um, which is one of the islands in the, uh, in, on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, so uh, Merry Christmas from Australia. There's all my contact details and all the references um, are on UQ eSpace there. And I welcome your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Linda. We, we don't have questions from our room here, Linda, so let's take a look at what the, uh, the online audience uh, says. Uh, so online audience, please ask your questions via the chat box. While we're waiting for that, I actually have a question, Linda. Um, so uh, specifically towards the end, you, you kind of talked about a potential, what it seemed to me, a potential uh, friction even uh, between uh, the social cure and impairment based uh, intervention right do you really see yeah. that as two um, opposing uh, approaches do you really feel that the friction is necessary I, I don't um, but I see that um, speech pathologists do they they are not sure what they should be doing. So they are, um, I think they're trying to straddle uh, all approaches and, and do holistic therapy. Um, and, uh, but what I've seen as well is that um, the, the solution to that approach, so the solution to how you choose what approach you take in therapy it shouldn't be ours, it should be the patient and the caregivers. So what I'm seeing is that, and, and the evidence from stroke audits, et cetera, back this up, that, um, uh, that, uh, the, um, that goal setting uh, for the person with aphasia and their caregiver is not being done in a way that allows the person to start choosing what their goals are and how to achieve those goals. So just imagine, um, Dirk, probably I think one of the analogies is if I, one of my, my, my brother-in-law had a diagnosis of lung cancer. And when we went to the oncologist, uh, the oncologist uh, said, well, these are your treatment options. You can have radiotherapy, you can have chemotherapy. The, the chance of success with each of those is this or that or whatever. These are the side effects. These are the consequences of each of the approaches. And this is what it entails. It's a fully informed decision-making process. We're certainly not there yet in terms of enabling the care partner and their person with aphasia to make informed choices around what um, treatments that they would like to receive. Uh, so that's really about developing some sort of decision aid um, around treatment options. So um, 
do I see it as a tension? It's always a tension there, I think, uh, Dirk, whether we want it to be there or not. It's a complex thing, this aphasia rehabilitation. And um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think amongst the researchers anyhow, I hope that there is uh, a lot of respect for each of the sciences involved. But um, I think at the, when we get down to the nitty gritty of what services are being offered and uh, how do people with aphasia and their family members perceive those services, then we've got a lot, we've got a long way to go. Thank you. So we have a compliment online. I'm not sure if you can read that, Linda. Uh, it says uh, from uh, Nidhi Mahendra, thank you for an excellent talk. Despite some technical difficulties, difficulties, your insights are as usual spot on. So seeing that there are no other questions. Ah, here we, we have a question. I was about to say, seeing that we have no further questions, that's a good note to end on. But we do have a question from Sam Harvey. Uh, are you able to read that question or should I read it out to you? Yes. So um, this is by Sam Harvey. It's uh, early support discharge. It's obviously difficult to prognostic prognosticate aphasia recovery. Clinicians have a set of tools which they hope will have a positive impact on a person's recovery and long-term well-being. What advice would you provide to clinicians who need to advocate for early discharge home versus prolonged, potentially more intensive, inpatient rehabilitation. Again, I think we, we need to go back to um, uh, enabling um, the voice of the person with aphasia and their caregiver. So certainly I would see that whatever is done in that sort of advocacy effort is with the person with aphasia and their caregiver. Um, I. In terms of, uh, it's also, I think, about um, making sure that it's not an either or. Um, intensive, uh, intensive therapy should be able to be offered in the community. So I'm not sure why we think that intensive therapy can only be offered as an inpatient. So uh, my feeling is that, um, if you're in the situation though and you're trying to advocate for uh, early supported discharge, then the key word is support. Um, it's not just going home without support and it's about advocating for that intensive aphasia rehabilitation. If the person with aphasia and their family member want it, once the person has gone home, um, so that's just my view, uh, Sam. I don't know what your perspective of that is. Um, Julius has, uh, in your career, what do you think have been the most positive developments in the care of persons with aphasia? And what do you think is a realistic future for major improvements in the near future? Um, funnily enough, uh, the, the recognition of um, the recognition of depression as a major underlying contributing factor to the achievement of outcomes um, was certainly um, an aha moment, I think, for me. And all of our research, we've, we've, I think we did about three or four sort of studies where we found that mood was an underlying factor um, in quality of life and in successfully living with aphasia. It just kept on coming out as a, a major factor when we measured it. Um, and uh, so my feeling is that there is a strong willingness of um, service providers to embrace this concept that we need to identify the presence and screen for the presence of um, depression. And, uh, but also I would, um, and then put in place this stepped care model. 
So certainly the sort of mental health sort of side of things um, has been a, had a big impact certainly here in Australia and it's certainly resonating I think with a lot of aphasia clinicians. Um, but I guess you know it's hard to sort of pick out your your your, your uh, favourite moment. Um, I I loved seeing that uh, the ICF being the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health become mainstream in aphasia rehabilitation talk. Um, whereas at the beginning of my PhD, it was just beginning to be published, and it was um, uh, the the idea that aphasia was more than an impairment. Um, uh, has certainly been an important um, uh, step uh, in our service provision. Um, so, yeah, I think those probably some of those sort of things have been some of the big sort of steps um, in my career. Um, but, yeah, yeah uh, Julius, I'd probably like to think about that a bit more too. Um, so this uh, needy sort of then sort of asks two questions. Um, is there published evidence that more optimistic or hopeful people with aphasia have better long-term outcomes than those who are not? We seem to know this an anecdotally. Um, second, how do you see this research, aphasia research, changing with increasing emphasis on participatory design? Uh, I would love to see every all research that we do being co-designed with people with aphasia and their family members. Um, you know, we, we're currently with uh, in Queensland here. Uh, Dave Copland um, has received a large philanthropic grant for the Queensland Aphasia Rehabilitation Centre, and that uh, Sarah Wallace, the Australian Sarah Wallace has um, uh, is co-designing that center with people with aphasia and their caregivers and that's a PhD and I think that's that's great because that's right from the get-go um, they're sort of hopefully involving people with aphasia and their family members not only um, at the start of the aphasia center but also to be involved in all research that goes on in that aphasia center the, your first question about the level of optimism, um, I don't know of any research that's in that area. So we have a question from Catherine Pettigrove, a comment rather than a question. Thank you, Linda. The poem you shared was beautiful, and I think the reference to diagnosis of hope really emphasizes that friction between impairment versus social approaches. A lovely patient of mine was recently told by a rehab specialist that he would never get any better. Although perhaps from an impairment perspective, that may not be untrue, he came away feeling devastated and infuriated because as he told me, he has so much more life left to live. Not everything is about the impairment. Providing hope regardless of impairment level is so important. Thank you for everything you do to help this happen. Good night. Okay, so that was more of a comment, yeah. I, I think... Okay, that, so... Yeah, if, since we don't have any other questions, I'd say uh, just a reminder to the, uh, the online audience as well that uh, this is part of a series. Um, uh, if you want to be uh, kept up to date uh, on the upcoming talks, Linda, what is the website to go to? Can you mention it? Uh, the next one will be hosted by Aphasia Access. Okay. So, um, yeah, but we'll publicise um, each lecture through all the usual channels, through CSTAR, through Aphasia Access, through collaboration of Aphasia Trialists, through the Aphasia CRE here in Australia, Twitter, whatever, whatever it is. Great. Well, thank you very much again, and thanks for hanging in there fighting the noise uh, battle. Thank you, um, yeah. The good news is that your the whole lecture is recorded, uh, so we will make an edited version where we 
clip out uh, all the white noise. And for those people who are really interested in noise, I can make a special version where you only hear the white noise. <laughs> we publish both on YouTube. So there's something for everyone. Thanks for watching. Okay.